Washington, Illinois, 150 miles southwest of Chicago. Sunday, November 17th, 2013. It had been unseasonably warm. And while we typically have a severe weather season in late spring, it's not unusual to experience a secondary severe weather season in the fall time. Sandy Gallant is working as a meteorologist at WEEK-TV in Peoria, 11 miles west of Washington. I'm meteorologist Sandy Gallant. Are you storm ready? In the week leading up to November 17th, it was not a question of if there was going to be a severe weather event that weekend, but when is this going to happen and where? I really didn't check the weather. I mean, we're busy. We got four kids and, uh, you know, the twins' birthday's coming up. So um, I really didn't think much about the weather. At the time, twins Vivian and Hudson Essig are five years old. It was a nice warm morning, like we could have done some activities later that day or something like that. I remember we were all going to eat breakfast in the morning, and my parents decided that they're going to go uh, birthday shopping for me and Hudson. At that time, my oldest son, Winston, was 11 years old, so he stayed home with the twins. Joining his parents on the shopping trip, eight-year-old Oliver. When they pull out of the driveway, they have no idea what's brewing just a few miles to the west. We started to notice on the radar these discrete cells developing west of the Illinois River. And it really was a matter of minutes before we had supercells on our hands. And this was literally like lifting the lid off of a pan of popcorn, and suddenly you have just things popping up everywhere. Sandy is on the air with fellow meteorologist Chuck Collins. If you are in the path of this cell, now is the time to take shelter, get to your basement, get to the centermost portion of your home, and take cover. I started to hear the sound. And it sounded like thunder, the rumbling of thunder. But unlike the rumbling of thunder that you hear in a thunderstorm, this rumbling started to deepen and become louder and louder. And it was starting to sound closer. And I looked up and I just said, Chuck, I'm hearing something. I am hearing things right now, Chuck. Yes. I think we, um, we may need to take shelter right yes. now ourselves. We do. We need to go off we the do. air. Yeah. We will be back when we can. I stood up, grabbed my computer, and started yelling to the production crew, let's go. We gotta go take shelter right this second. And my director at one point asked me, is that a tornado I'm hearing? And I said, yes, it is. The station property was hit, but the building itself was not directly hit. When we got back on the air, we looked at our data and saw that the tornado that had just hit the station property was taking aim at Washington. Dustin Essig is driving with his wife and eight-year-old son Oliver when they get the tornado alerts. We were about five minutes into our trip. We were driving and warnings went off on the phone. So we called Winston right away and Winston said, you know, I got the warning too. I'm down in the basement with the twins. We turned around and headed back. Brunson told us to get down into the basement just to be safe. And we were heading downstairs and we all looked out and you could see like the sky wasn't as blue as it was before and the trees were kind of blowing around. Just a block away, Chris Lancaster is home with his wife and children when he sees the tornado taking shape from his back porch. We started seeing funnel clouds come down. And that's when I thought, oh, cool, I'm gonna take a quick little video. Oh my God, Chris. Yeah. Look at the flying, Mandy. Then I just got mesmerized by it and kept watching it. 
thought it was just going to be a little cloud, you know, it was going to be cool looking. Look at this flying! It looked like it was going to curve off to the northwest of where I live. It just kept coming like, you know, like a freight train. Be ready to roll, everybody. Just kept on coming. Leave that door so I can get in. Leave that door so I can get in. I told the kids to go to the basement. That's pretty much when it all broke loose. The time we first saw the tornado, we were probably about three miles from home. I looked down the street, and the tornado's, it's in our backyard. I mean, it's this just big, monstrous, black, glowing cloud that's right in our backyard. All of a sudden, like, this rumbling sound, kind of like a train. A giant blender or something, like, kind of just, like, chopping up everything around us. We just kind of hoped that we'd still be alive after. Look at all the roof, bro! Then it started getting bigger and bigger, and then it just kept coming. You could see cars flying through there, trees, houses, plywood. That's when I thought, well, here we go. Kiss my little bye-bye. It just kept coming. Oh, my God! Holy Look at this, bud! So um, I thought, truly, it was like, oh, here we go. We're, you know, I'm going to die on this one. When it first hit East Peoria, it was at an EF1 stat. And by the time it hit Washington, it was an EF4 with maximum sustained winds of 190 miles an hour and had a width of a half a mile. It was a monster. And it was wreaking havoc on Washington. The Essigs are racing home as their five-year-old twins are huddled in the basement with their 11-year-old brother. When he first heard the tornado, he threw some blankets over us. It was kind of like when you're in one of those moments where like your stomach is hurting and that stuff. I didn't know if it was like a reality. It just didn't seem like one of those days where like it was gonna happen. I don't think we had the full understanding of a tornado. We were a little bit nervous once we heard loud sounds and stuff. But I don't think we fully understand what it could do. I'm actually driving about 100 miles an hour at that time. Everything's just dark, and we really didn't know where the tornado was. And when I pull up to Coventry Drive that we lived on, I look down the street. My house is four doors down. I can see my house, and I can see the tornado behind it. My plan was, I don't know what my plan was at the time. <laughs> I mean, I got lost in the video. By the time I turned that corner to go, it was too late. Washington, Illinois, November 2013. Chris Lancaster is shooting video of a powerful EF4 tornado as it slams into his house. All the insulation and the plywood and the glass and the debris flying, you know, through the house. The refrigerator come flying through the wall, it hit me in the head, it threw me back across the room. And then I remember trying to get up again in a bunch of wood, like I think it was trusses, shingles, stuff like that was knocking me all across the room again. Oh, house! One block away, five-year-old twins Vivian and Hudson Essig are taking cover in their basement with their older brother, Winston. It, it was very, very loud. And it's almost like a huge chainsaw cutting your house in half. I just remember looking down at the floor and like, just praying that we'd be alive. The most terrifying part was, I didn't know if like, our parents were alive. In fact, Dustin Essig, his wife Kirsten, and son Oliver are just arriving in their devastated neighborhood. 
We got out of the car and started running down the street. The street we had just driven up, we couldn't run down it. I mean, it was piled waist high or higher with debris, so we couldn't even run down that street. And we saw a police car coming towards us on the street that we were on, and he couldn't reach us because there was so much debris, so we had to run to him. The officer's dash camera captures the moment. Please hurry. We're frantic. We're like, you know, you got to get us home. We got kids at home. You got to get us home. Uh, he turned around. <laughs> My babies are home. My babies are home. So he had to go a different direction to get to our house. We came to our road, and Coventry Drive curves around like this. And our house is over here. So when he turns down Coventry Drive, all these houses are just leveled. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No! 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 In the newsroom, we had the scanners on listening to the radio traffic from emergency responders who were saying things like, Washington is devastated. We have subdivisions that have just been wiped off the planet. And at that point, the concern was, is there a loss of life? I just remember looking, was there anything up? Was there a wall up or something that could protect the kids? But um, as I got closer, I just, I mean, it was, it was surreal looking at it. And I, I couldn't imagine that anybody could survive that. That's our house is gone. I remember I was just looking at my house, and my house in particular uh, was completely gone. I mean, there was no debris on top of it, nothing. It just took everything off the top. So I started running down the road and um, screaming uh, Winston's name. And before I reached the house, maybe a house or two before, I see Winston walk upstairs from the basement. And I ran up to him and just, we really didn't say anything. We just grabbed each other and hugged each other, and he just said, the twins are fine. Well, to get out of the basement, it took a little work because everything was, like, piled waist high, and, like, we had to get on our hands and knees and climb up the stairs. Like, we couldn't use the railings or anything because there was none. And then we saw our parents, and it was kind of just, like, surprising. And then I see they're still in their pajamas, and they came walking around the corner, walking up the stairs, and... That was an unbelievable feeling. We were just hugging each other, and we really didn't have anything to say. I kind of just didn't really care about, like, the house. I just was glad to see my parents just standing there and my other brother and my mom just standing there alive and happy to see us and stuff. Winston, uh, I, it's unbelievable what he did and how calm he stayed. He just took every precaution and a uh, pretty amazing kid to be able to do all that. It kind of makes me feel happy, especially since, like, me and Hudson are now the same age as he was during that time. I don't think I could have necessarily done that. I don't think I could have kept as calm as he did. I think we were just in such shock. And every direction you look, 360, it's just leveled and devastated. The tornado must have gone through our living room or something because the only thing that was left was the plywood flooring and the hardwood floors. Carpets were ripped up and everything. There was absolutely nothing left. You could take a broom and just dust off what was left. The Essex neighbor, Chris Lancaster, after filming the tornado hitting his house, is buried in debris. I think the wife didn't know if she was gonna have to tell the kids, you know, their dad's dead. By the time I came outside, it was a whole different world. Washington, Illinois, November 17th, 2013.
After filming an EF4 tornado making a direct hit on his house, Chris Lancaster digs himself out of the debris that was once his home. I think the wife didn't know if she was going to have to tell the kids, you know, their dad's dead, because I was outside filming like, you know, a moron. Chris suffers a laceration to his eye and a concussion. His wife and children, who took shelter in the basement, are unharmed. My house was uh, pretty much leveled down. It had one wall standing in the whole thing. It was a whole different world. The whole area was leveled, smoky, nasty smelling. It smelled like gas and people coming up out of their basements, their kids coming up out of crawling out of floors, people trying to pull people out of floors, dogs running wild, just the, the stuff you see just laying around everywhere. Nothing was there. You had large subdivisions completely erased by Mother Nature. streets, you had a cul-de-sac, you knew that a subdivision, a neighborhood once existed here. But then you had homes that were completely wiped off their foundation. Over $900 million in property damage. And the loss of property extended from lower income homes to half a million dollar homes. Three fatalities and 125 injuries are reported. It's pretty amazing that 5,000 people were in the path of that tornado. Three people died. And what is credited for that low mortality rate is the advance warning. And there is another saving grace. You have people who on a Sunday morning had gotten up, left their house, went to church. And there are church communities in Washington that were spared even being hit by that tornado. And in a lot of ways, that's a miracle. In the aftermath of the tornado, members of the community give thanks to Sandy and her weather team as well. I received emails from viewers who told me, you know what, I got up that morning, I turned on my TV, and I saw you on the air. And I don't normally heed those type of warnings, but there was just something about how you said it and the tone in your voice that told me, I have to take shelter right now. We need to go off we the do. air. Yeah. We will be back when we can. Right. So to be told what you did that day saved lives is humbling. As cleanup begins, residents band together under the Washington Strong banner. Chris Lancaster and his family decide to rebuild their home on the same spot in the town they love. I honestly believe that the community came together after that storm and worked with each other and helped each other. That community support is something the Essig children will never forget. People brought us dinner sometimes. Like they would bring us like gift cards or they would bring us toys and some people would bring clothes, just different stuff to help us out. There was no doubt I was staying here. My kids are here, they're established here. Uh, the community came out. You really realized what a, uh, a great community you live in. So I ended up not building on that spot. It was such a bad experience that we built elsewhere. And today, Washington is strong. Washington looks great. Neighborhoods were built literally in a few months. There is a sense of community and that people know their neighbors. This tornado ended up being the first EF4 tornado to hit the state of Illinois in the month of November in recorded history. And it is considered the costliest 
and deadliest tornado outbreak for the state of Illinois in November ever. For some, it's a piece of history they'd just as soon forget. Oh. That's it on that one. Last time that video gets watched by me.